Um, I don't remember exactly where we're at, so we're going to bring up what we had last time, and it will serve as a bit of a review, both for you and for me. All right. Uh, I think I know where we're at, but I'm, I'm covering this same example in a couple of classes. So, because this is a nice, nice, it's a simple enough game that we can, we can easily write the code for it, and, um, yet, yet there's enough going on that we can make some real classes. Alright, so, let me extract the zip file. And let me go in and open it up in Visual Studio, and we'll have a go. I believe we were like halfway through refactoring this, if I remember right. We took out of our web page the code for a die, all right, with the assumption that we could be writing a bunch of dice games. So therefore, it'd be nice to have a component where we could just plop on the page and use it, all right. So I think that was our assumption, and I think we removed the code relating to the die from the page. But we still have a little bit more refactoring to do. All right. So let's uh, open this guy up and, and verify that I am indeed correct, review what we've done, and then talk about what our next move is going to be. my website here. All right, now the question becomes, where did I unzip that to? take two. Now we can should be able to go and open it. File open website. Hi low. Again, we don't want this folder. We want the folder that contains the um, web config file, which would be this folder. All right. Notice that we have a couple more folders than we had in the initial example. In the initial example, we just had the one folder that contained the web config file, the um, our web page, our code behind. We added an images folder, and we just did that for the same reason you create a folder in any context, just to, to put the images separately from 
the rest of the stuff just to, to keep it easier to keep track of. We also have an app code folder, and the app code folder allows the object to be shared um, more easily. All right, so, or the class to be shared most easily, more easily. And in that folder, we have a die CS. And this is a class. What is a class? A class is a place where we create essentially a little software model of something. All right, we create in software a component that represents this thing. And again, in this case, this is a, a thing that's in our actual problem domain. If, our, if we were a game uh, writing company, you know, die is one of the, uh, a pair of dice and dice would be one of the uh, components, one of the entities in our problem domain. All right? And so we're creating a component for it. ASP.NET creates components for a lot of more generic functioning, remember, like validation and calendars and stuff like that. Things that a lot of people are going to use, but they're not really tied to a specific problem, right? They can't solve everyone's problem in ASP.NET, right? But they can give you a framework on which you can solve your own problems by taking uh, some of the grunt work off your hands. So you don't have to worry about validation, you just use a validation control. All right, so in this case, given that we are in this case, hypothetically, a game um, um, writing organization, um, we might want to create a component for something that's part of our problem that we can reuse throughout our applications. And again, in this case, it's a die. In other cases, it could be like a shipping calculation or a shipping method or something like that. Or for students, there could be a student class that has GPA, calculating tuition, all these different things. So um, we create a component, and you create that component as a class. And a class is meant to be a template, a description of what that component can do. Everything about the component that's relevant to our application, we're going to put in this code here. All right? Now again, relevant is a key word. It really depends on, on um, the problem that you're trying to solve. So for our cases, what's relevant is that a die has a value, right? We roll the die, it has a value from 1 to 6. You can roll the die and find out what it is. And you can get the image name associated with it. All right, so I can create a die, roll it, and then ask it, hey, what image represents you? All right, now we could have other behaviors as well uh, in there. Uh, again, a student, if you think of a student, um, everything about a student would be put in the student class. All the behaviors and all the attributes that we were interested in. So the student's birth date, a student's name, a student's address, phone number, email address, major, as well as calculations like how many credit hours does a student earn? What is the student's GPA? What is the student's tuition bill for fall of 2015? And so on. All of those behaviors are put in the class. All right? That term is known as encapsulation. All right, where you put everything that relates to an entity in one place. So that's nice, because then all you have to do is plug that com component in, and you can do anything that you need to do with it. Because anything that a die is able to do, well, my program can do now, because I'm using that die component. All right? Okay, so we did that, and then we simplified the default.aspx.cs, by taking some of the behavior that used to be coded in here and using our dice class to um, implement that. So we don't random number generate in here, right? This page doesn't know, doesn't need to know how we're rolling the die, right? This dice, th this, this page simply asks the dice to roll itself and gets the response back, gets the answer back of what was rolled. 
All right. The good news is we only get that lot. We only need to get that logic done right. If you remember from the lecture last time, and it's now starting to come clear to me what we talked about last time. All right. We ran into an issue where we kept rolling the same number over and over and over again because of the way that we were randomly generating the number and the way that we were creating these objects. It was too close together in time, and therefore the time seeding uh, didn't generate a different set of random numbers. So we figured out a way around that, and we corrected it. The good news is, is that no one else, and by no one else, I mean no other programmer, needs to figure out that problem from now on. We've solved it. All right, and we've put that <coughs> behavior in the die class. So anyone that uses that class is going to get the proper method for rolling a dice to generate random numbers. So that's something that this code doesn't need to worry about anymore. All right, just like we don't have to worry about writing the HTML to create a calendar because we can use the calendar component. All right, there still is one thing that we can take out of this as far as refactoring goes. And that is, the rules of the game are actually part of this class, right? In other words, what are the rules of the game? Well, the rules of the game are that if you, 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 you pick either low, seven, or high, you roll the dice, two through six means low, seven means seven, eight through 12 means high. And if you get it right, you win. If you get it wrong, you lose. And then there's payoffs associated with that and so on. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the rules of that game and put it in its own class as well. All right? That way, if we ever needed to play this game on another web page, you know, or if we needed to, you know, call it from another application or anything like that. We would have this available so that we wouldn't have to rewrite the rules. So again, it would become a component. We just need to plug in to that component. Now, when we're done with this, this event, this click handler, all right, this, this button click event, isn't going to contain a lot of code in it. All right? It's going to contain the code to simply gather the input that's needed, create the appropriate object or objects, call the appropriate methods, and then display the result. So none of the like thinking part of this, like how do I generate a random number, what are the rules of this game, and so on, are going to be contained in here. This guy is just going to be the glue between our user interface and the business logic or problem domain logic. So again, think of shipping calculations. You know, you may have shipping calculations done in a lot of different places throughout your application. Well, and they can be complicated, right? Depending on where you're shipping to, where you're shipping from, um, how, how soon a person needs it, how big the package is. There's a lot of factors that go into that. Well, you want to only have to get that right once. Right? You don't want to have to get that right a half dozen times for the half dozen places where this calculation is required. So when you get it done, one, uh, done correctly once, you want to put that code somewhere so that it can be reused. And again, reusability leads to maintainability, right? Because if there's a problem with the shipping calculation, or even if there isn't a problem, if, if an organization changes their rules about, like, what they ship. You know, we no longer deliver on Saturdays, or we're going to start delivering on Saturdays. If the shipping company changes their rules, all right, we only have to make that change in one place. So our job here is going to be to make another class that's going to contain the rules of the game. What do we think is going to be in that class? Classes, remember, have two things. They have properties. Properties are characteristics of them, if you will. Um, members of the class. Not instance, but like parts of the class. Like, like an automobile might have as attributes tires, right? because tires are part of the things that make up the class. 
All right, of automobile. What do we think is going to be in this class? Can someone turn the lights on? Okay. That's you guys' job until you move seats, is when the projector is on, make sure the lights are off, and the projector is off, make sure the lights are on. So you guys will probably get here early and be sitting up here so you don't have to. What's going to be in this class? What's going to be in the game class? Is my mic on? Testing. What is going to be in the game class? All right, how you win, effectively, the rules of the game, all right? So the rules of the game are going to be in the game class. So I'm going to call this high-low game, all right? So there's going to be a method that says play the game and tell me if you won or lost. What is that function going to look like? That is, when I ask what a function is going to look like, a lot of times I'm referring to what's called the signature of the function. What is the signature of the function? Well, it's the name of the function. It's the arguments that are called, or the arguments that are, that are given when the function is called, arguments that need to be supplied, and then the return value. Now remember, a function can only return one thing. All right, so we have to keep that in mind. So, let's start off this and say the function is called play. Are there going to be any arguments to this function? Should be Pardon me? Uh, that won't necessarily be an argument. That will come into play. But if I were to play the game, let's say I was playing the game. And in fact, people actually do this sometimes in object-oriented design sessions is they have people represent the objects, all right? So in other words, if, if, if I, I should have brought some dice in, but we can, we can use our, as, as, as Barney would say, I think it's Barney, or no, SpongeBob, we can use our imagination, all right? So let's say you wanted to play the game, all right? So you come up to me and say you want to play the game, all right? What am I going to need to know from you? No, you're not gonna you're not gonna tell me the size of the dice. I got the dice probably here in my pocket, right? So a characteristic or an attribute of me or something that I have is a pair of dice. Don't we have to call the main method? Okay. We do have to call the method to play the game. That's true. But if you said I want to play this high low game right now, I'll say fine. What are you gonna have to tell me? You have to tell me what your choice is. Okay, do you want high, do you want low, or do you want seven? So, if you want to play the game, you'd come up to me and say, let's play high, low, my choice is seven. What am I going to do then? I'm going to go and I'm going to roll, pull out of my pocket the dice, I'm going to roll them. Ooh, two and four, you lose. All right? Come and play it again. What are you going to do? You pick seven. Pull the dice out. Oh, seven. You win. All right? So, let's think of that in terms of functions. What is the choice of high or low? That's going to be the argument to the function. Right? So, this function is going to accept, and again, we can do this a bunch of different ways, but it's going to accept an integer as the argument of what the user has selected. An integer. What is this function going to return? <coughs> What's the answer that the function? It's going to return a boolean. All right. It's going to say yes, you won. No, you didn't win. All right. So that's the answer. All right. Now you can imagine. All right. Let's say you know. Not that. Not that I gamble. 
you imagine if we were gambling on this? Would you look and say, well, okay, darn, I lost again. Here's my money. No. At some point, you'd say, hmm, I lost 56 in a row here, right? You better let me see those dice, <laughs> right? So, there's going to be, other, and okay, so there's going to be a method to play, and it's going to return the Boolean. So this will be one method, a public method, that's going to return a Boolean, you give it the choice, but, again, well, even, even if we were playing this as a game, even, even discounting cheating, it's pretty boring just to say you won, you lost. You want to see the dice to see, oh, okay, that's what it was. So, <coughs> show die one, it's going to return a string. It's going to return a string that says, this is the image name for the die. Show die 2 is going to return a string that shows the image name for die 2. Could we do this a different way? Instead of having two functions, show die 1 and show die 2. The answer of if we could do it a different way is always yes, just as an FYI. So if I was dumb enough ever to give you a true or false test, in a programming class, and the question was, could you do this another way? The answer is always true. Yes, I could. All right, so I'll give you that part of the answer right off. What would be another way that we could do this? Instead of having two functions, show die one and show die two. I'm just talking about functions. I'm not talking about how, what's going on inside the functions yet. Let's talk about signatures of functions. Do I have to have two functions? No. I could have one function, right? If I had one function, what would it return and what would its arguments be? to make this 
work with only one function, because we're still stuck with two functions here. We could either return the name of the die, or we could return the die object, and then the die object could return the name. All right? How could we make this? What would we need to do to make this work with one method? Well, if you told me to show the die, show you the die, what additional information would you have to give me? Which one you want to see? So, you could write this by having an argument that was either a 1 or a 2. That would tell me which die that I wanted to see. All right. So, I could have a method that says show die 1 that requires no argument, show die 2 that requires no argument. Or I could have a method that says show die, but I'd have to give it a one or a two when I ran it. Right? Either way is reasonable all right, to do it. Um, in this case, I'm just going to make two methods and be done with it. Because this game, I'm going to assume that this game, the rules are rigidly defined and I don't see the rules changing. In other words, you probably could make a version of this game with three die and give different categories for that, but we're going to pretend we're not going to do that. All right, we're going to discount that possibility. All right, but maybe we're talking about more dice games. Maybe we're going to have an array of dice so that you could play with five dice if you're playing Yahtzee or whatever. But again, um, we're going to keep it simple in this case. Now. Again, in the analogy of if I represent a game, the UI gives me its choice, I have the dice in my pocket, two of the things that I have are I have die one and die two. Alright, so those are attributes, those are characteristics of me as a game. So, what do I have? I have two die. What can I do? I can play the game, tell you if you won or lost, and tell you what picture the die is for each of the two. So let's go and let's build this class, and then we're going to use it. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to make a new class, and I'm going to call it high-low game. Real quick question. So mm -hmm. you make it public so that way you can access it when like, you're in the button? So if it's private, you can't actually access it. I will, make, I will make methods public. I'll make the class public, and I'll make methods public. Because other people have to use a class, right? Um, and you have to be able to interact with the class, and you'll do that through the methods. I will make the attributes private. In other words, <laughs> look at it this way. This, this is one of the reasons, I didn't even intend this, but this is one of the reasons why this is a good example. All right? <coughs> I want control of those dice. I'm not going to, like, give them to Louie, and Louie's like, seven, I win again. Seven, I win again, you know, if he can. So I don't want people messing with the, that class's attributes, all right, and manipulating possibly those class's attributes. So I'm going to make them private. You want to play the game, you have to ask me to roll the dice, and I will tell you what they came up with, as opposed to handing the dice to you, and you may be handling them in the wrong way. Okay. So. I'm going to go in here, I'm going to say new file. Class. I'm going to call it high low game.
add. It's telling me that I want to, do I want to put in the app code folder? Yes, I do. So I got a blank slate. So I can put stuff in here. So, notice the class is public. There's constructor logic here, which I'm going to delete. All right. We're not talking about constructors right now. So I'm going to delete the constructor. Uh, you could leave it in. and It wouldn't do any harm. And I'm going to make my attributes. What are my attributes? What does this game have? What do I, as the controller of the game, have? I have two dies. So I'll make die d1 equals new die. Die d2 equals new die. All right. I said there's going to be three methods. And I'm going to just put them in with their signature right off the bat. Public, Boolean, do public bool. <coughs> um, what was this? I'll play. And it's going to accept an int as an argument. And it's going to represent the user's choice. I'm then going to put my two methods to get the two dice images. to first. What is the code going to be for get die image 1 and get die image 2? Or get die 1 image, get die 2 image? What's the code going to be? Well, I already have a get image name method on the die. So, if you're going to say get the value of the die, and then concatenate stuff together to form the name of the image, that's not the right approach, right? Because giving me the image that belongs to a die <coughs> is a function that a die can perform. So all I have to do in the game class is call that function and return the value of it. So I'm going to say here, return d1 <coughs> dot get image name and I'm going to say over here d2 get image name this is known as delegation in other words you ask me for the name of the image, I ask the die for the name of the image. All right? It sounds like a roundabout way, but if anything about the way that we store our images changes, all right, we only need to change the code in the one place. So I effectively just sort of pass on the information from the die. Louis says, show me a picture of that die, of the first die. 
Me as a game, ask the first die, give me your image. And then I take that and give it to Louie. Maybe the analogy is starting to fall apart at this point, but you get the idea. So the game itself doesn't need to know how the images are stored, right? That's the die's job. That's some information about the die. So everything about the die is going to live in that die class. The game doesn't need to know about it. The game just needs to know, hey, I have two die. If I want the image, this is what I do. Okay? So, that's the easy part. Any questions about that part? Now remember, die is our class, and by class we mean sort of a template that describes some entity within the problem. Die 1 and die 2, or D1 and D2, are objects. That is, they are specific members of that entity. In other words, they would represent the actual two dice that are being used in this game. All right? There's a lot of dice in the world. All right? The die class has the code for all of those assuming six-sided dies in the world. All right? However, to play a game, we don't use all the dice in the world, or we don't use some theoretical concept of what a die is. We use two specific dices. So we're going to make two specific dice using the template that is contained in the die class. All right. So... The actual game logic itself, we can copy and paste a good deal of that. In fact, I'm going to copy and paste this in here. And I'm going to make a couple of changes, though. So far, so good, right? It, it, it kind of looks like, kind of looks like I'm I'm almost there, except for the fact that it doesn't know what this drop-down list is. Why doesn't it know what this drop-down list is? Because it's not part of that page anymore, right? This there was a drop-down list one that was on the page that this originally came on. All right. But let's think about this. We could allow this game to be played from several pages. We could allow this game to be played from a page that has not a drop-down list, but radio buttons. In fact, if I remember right, the first version of this did use radio buttons. We could actually be studying this game, learning probability, and simulate 1,000 runs of the game to see how often we win and how often we lose. So there might not be a drop-down at all. We may randomly generate the user's choice and let it go through this. The point is, is this code here ties, tethers, binds the problem domain logic with the user interface. And that's a bad thing. Because if they're bound together, we can't use one without the other. So we have to decouple them. We have to move them apart so that they can operate independently. All right? So we're not going to use the drop-down list for the user choice. Because there might not be a drop-down list. Where are we going to get the drop-down list? Or, I'm sorry, where are we going to get the value of the user's choice from? From the argument to the function. So whoever calls this function is responsible for giving this function the user's choice. It might come from a drop-down list. Like in this case, that's where it's going to come from. It could come from radio buttons. It could randomly be generated. I could have a button that says, click this and play a thousand games and tell me how many won and lost by randomly choosing. Doesn't matter from the perspective of this class where the choice comes from, 
It just needs a choice. All right? It needs a 0, 1, or 2. All right? And whoever's playing the game, whatever UI is associated with the game, is responsible for getting the user's choice and plugging it into this function. So I can actually get rid of this user choice variable because we're now getting the user choice as an argument. right because we already made those <coughs> so we can just roll those dice these are the dice associated with the game okay something's wrong here I'll have to take a look at that in a second look and see what is wrong. Uh, you're right. I have I have an int D1 and I have a dice D1. There we go. Good good eye. So there we go. And again, of course, because that's declared in the function, all right, it, um, it uh, takes precedence over the declarations that are made outside of it. All right. So it's, it's giving us an error and a warning. Oops. The error is that this function doesn't return a value. And the warning is that we're putting something in B1, but we're never using it. Well, those two sort of go together, right? You know, we should be returning B1. All right, so I'll go and add on the end, return. And that should get rid of both of those errors, which it did. So now this function is self-contained. This function doesn't need anything from the outside world. The outside world being the user interface or any code that's going to be using this class. All right. This function, give it the user choice. 0, 1, or 2. Low, 7, or high. It's going to do its thing. It's going to roll the dice. It's going to tally up the dice. It's going to look at the user's choice and see, did they win or lose? And it's going to return back B1, whether they won or lost. That's all it's doing. All right? What is the user interface's job then? The user interface's job is to create the necessary object or objects, call the appropriate, or, or gather the input that those objects need, call the appropriate method, and then do something with the results. Now, in this case, I'm simply returning a true or false. I'm not saying what to do when they've won or lost. We could do a lot of stuff when they've won or lost, right? We could, we could display an animated GIF of someone jumping up and down excited, all right, because they won, right? We could simply display a text message that says you won, you lost. All right? We could change the colors to happy colors if they won, sad colors if they lost. All right? The way that we represent to the user that they've won or lost varies from user interface to user interface. Right? In this example, I'm simply displaying a message. But in other cases, I could do something a little more involved. 
All right. Again, think of me simulating this and running through a thousand test cases of this to determine like what the probability is that I'm going to win or lose. Right. I might not want to do something after every game. I may just want to tally up how many times a person won or lost, and then when I'm done, I can say the person won 200 out of 1,000 times or something like that. All right? So this function is self-contained. It doesn't care where the input comes from as long as you supply it. It doesn't care what you do with the answer as long as you know, it's just going to return the answer. It would kind of be like, maybe a better example would be, is let's imagine you have a shipping clerk. All right? Um, and the shipping clerk in this case is representing a shipping class from a shipping object. And there might be a method that says, how much is it going to cost to ship this package? Well, what would the arguments be? Well, where it's coming from, where it's going to, how big the package is, um, how quickly it's needed, all those sort of factors. If you ask this shipping clerk, that is, if you ask the object, how much would it cost to overnight this two-pound package from Cleveland to New York? All right? Shipping clerk's going to do the calculations and say it's going to cost you $15. Now, shipping clerk has done their job at that point, right? You asked them a question, they gave you the answer. Now, you may take that information and say, well, that's too expensive. Maybe they can wait another day. And you might ask the clerk then, how much is it going to cost to do it so it's next day? And then I give another answer, and so on. Or maybe you say, well, yeah, this is really important. I know $15 is expensive, but I'm going to ship it that way anyhow. So the shipping class is simply responsible for returning the answer of what the cost is. What the user then, and by user, I don't mean per human user. I'm talking about the program that's using this class. What they do with that, maybe they just display it on the screen. This is how much it will cost to ship it overnight. Maybe you ask the user a question. Do you want to use this shipping method or do you want to try another method? Whatever. That's up to the user interface. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to integrate this into the user interface. So I'm going to go here. And I'm kind of going to gut this because I don't need this anymore, right? Because that's, that's part of the problem domain of counting up how much the dice is. I'm going to keep the Boolean for B1. I don't need to roll the dice, right? The game is responsible for rolling the dice. I don't need to accumulate the total. The game is responsible for accumulating the total. I still need to grab the user choice from the UI, right? Because I need to supply that to the class. I don't need any of this logic. All I'm going to need then is, I'm going to need to create the game. So I'm going to say, hi, low game, h <coughs> equals new, hi, low game. In other words, this is my game, right? This is the user's game. This is a, there could be a bunch of games going on. We're interested in this specific game, all right? So I'm creating a specific game here. I'm going to then call the game method h dot play, and I'm going to give it the user choice. All right. So, I'm giving the play function what it needs. It needs the user choice. Someone comes up to me and says, I want to play the high-low game. Okay, so what? 
I can't play that game unless they tell me what they choose, that they chose high, that they chose low, whatever. So to play that game, you need to give a choice. All right? And to play that game, once I play the game, I got to tell the person whether they won or lost. All right? So that's what the arguments and return value relate to. The argument, the parameter that's passed into the function is user choice. That gets passed in. That gets plugged into this variable. This guy does its thing and then returns whether they've won or lost. And now this variable, b1, has a Boolean that says whether they've won or lost. And I can then set the label. Again, is that the only way I could do it? No. I could make one image appear if they won, another image appear if they lost. Okay? That's the UI's job to figure out how to handle the response back from the class. How do I want to visually represent to the user that they've won or lost? And you can do that a bunch of different ways. We're being boring here and just putting it in the label. All right? Now, one last thing. There's no longer a die object here or two die objects, so we have to ask the game object. Hey, by the way, person ain't going to take my word for it that they won or lost. Well, they may take my word for it that they won, but they're not going to take the <coughs> word for it that I lost. They need to see the dice. So h dot give me dice one's image and set that to the UI. H dot get die to image. Now again, if we were running a simulation of this, where we were just looping through and playing this game a thousand times just to see what the odds were, we wouldn't have to ask for the images, because we're not like visually displaying those to anything. We're just running the game over and over and over again and seeing what the results are. But this particular user interface, we have to show to the user what the image is. Now notice, let me remove some of these extra spaces here. Make it just a teeny bit smaller. Notice how small that button click event is now. Why is it small? Because it's not doing any of the work itself. It is simply the conduit, the connection between the stuff on the user interface, that is the user choice, the images, and the class. And the class does the work. The class has all the rules about it. This game really, I mean this logic, you know, I, 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 I have the bad habit of making programs sound like they're people, all right, and saying this project no, or this program knows or doesn't know. But this code really doesn't even really know that it's playing a dice game, right? It's just playing a game. It's taking a user choice, and it's getting back an answer, and it's displaying a couple images. This could be some other kind of game, right, from the user interface's perspective. So what we've done successfully is we've decoupled these. The UI is no longer tied up in with the... Um, with the um, um, business logic or problem, problem domain logic. Now, let's make sure this works, right? Because this lecture, just like last time, doesn't do me any good to go here and talk if I get goofy results. But it's a new week. I'm confident that this one's going to go well. Yeah, we should just quit then. Looks good. And it compiled, so hey, it must be right. All right, so I make my choice, seven, button, you lost. You lost. You lost. You lost. Hey, you finally won. I'll tell you, the odds are really stacked against you in this game if you do any of the probability calculations, but hey, you know, it's a simple enough game. 
you know, to, uh, to uh, do this. Questions at this point? Absolutely. I mean, it's building components. If you think about it like a computer, all right? A computer is obviously a set of components, right? Um, a computer system, let's say. You know, what do you have? You have a monitor. You know, you have a keyboard. You have, you know, the box. You might have some other stuff, too. I don't know. I don't really know a lot about computers, but you got, the, you got those three things, right? Now, the box itself actually contains components, right? Because there's a sound card in it. There is a um, um, video card. There is some sort of persistent storage. There's the motherboard, and so on. Now, each of those things contain components. They contain transistors, and this is seriously where my knowledge really does start to wear a little thin, all right? But there's all that, that electronic, um, stuff that itself are components that go together to, to make, uh, to, to, yeah, that, that's where the magic happens, exactly. All right? So the idea, you know, of putting an a, a, uh, objects and other objects is simply recognizing, well, these objects represent components. And a component itself can be comprised of a variety of things. I mean, even an automobile, you know, um, something I know less about than computers, all right? But I do know there's brakes, all right? Now, brakes is a component that could be part of a car. If, if you had, if you were building a model uh, in software of a car, you would have a brakes component, I would hope, all right? Uh, but the brakes itself has some components, right? There's the pedal, there's probably some sort of mechanism by which pressing the pedal acti actually actuates the brake stopping it, right? There's, you know, on many cars, especially newer ones, uh, anti-lock brake systems that have a set of components that handle things and all that. So again, the idea is that you want to take behaviors that are done, put it all in one place, and then you can build from there. So you're not making something brand new each time. You're sometimes assembling stuff. So let's imagine if we had another dice game that we wanted to do. We talked about Yahtzee last time, all right? We wouldn't have to redo the dice component, right? I don't think, anyhow, right? Because, um, why? Well, why, do, why don't we have to? Oh, because that does everything that a die needs to do. All right, or probably does anyhow. We would, would have to actually write it. Maybe you would have to tweak something. But probably we don't have to touch that at all because our die component does everything. So all we would end up building would be the Yahtzee rules class that would, again, integrate with the UI, have its own functions. Um, in Yahtzee, if I remember right, there is your first roll, then you have a second roll, then you have a third roll. The first roll, you roll all five dice. The second roll, you get to pick which dice you want to re-roll, and then you do that again on the third roll. All right? And then when you're done with the third roll, it scores it for you. All right? Do we want to do this next class? I don't know. We'll have to think about it. All right? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll think about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, but but the, the thing that would be important is, is the, you know, the die part has a handle. We don't, oh, we don't ever have to worry about that again unless there was something that we forgot or something that we decided, well, well, this will make our life a little easier if we add this method in here. Like one thing right off the bat I, I can see that would probably make our life easier, especially thinking of the Yahtzee example, would be... We could add to the die class a get value method.
That simply returns the value that the dice has. Because we might want to roll the dice and have it tell us the value, but we might want to, like, later on say, what was your value again, without having to re-roll it, right? Because re-rolling is going to change the value, at least potentially. All right? So, that would be one method that right off the bat I recognize that we could probably take advantage of. Um, so, that, let's, let's commit to doing that. Think about that between now and then. Think about what the Yahtzee rule object would look like. Now, I don't remember all the scoring for Yahtzee, so we're going to fake that, all right? But um, I do know, like, if you get, like, five of a kind, you get, like, 50 points, and four, four of a kind, you get, like, 30 points or something like that. I don't know. We can look it up, or we can make up our own rules, all right? We probably can't say Yahtzee anyhow because it's probably a, tra a trademark violation or a copyright violation, so we'll make... Um, we'll make our own version of it, all right? Okay, we'll see you in lab.